shop. Good evening. Our guest tonight, of course, is Ron Sanna. Ron and Sanna. He's a senior analyst at CNBC and a commentator. Uh, he gives his perspective on important business stories. He also appears on Squawk Box once a month. Previously, Mr. Insano was the anchor of CNBC Street Signs. He joined CNBC in 91 after a merger with Financial News Network. He's been a regular contributor to NBC's Today and NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams, as well as Imus in the Morning on MSNBC and other programs when market activity warrants. The general topic tonight, uh, according to Mr. Ansana, is a focus on the longer term outlook for the U.S. economy, and there's plenty to talk about. So he's here tonight from New York City, uh, a gracious speaker. Uh, Emily was instrumental in getting him here, so we have to give the Ansana family a cheer. And thank you for all for being here tonight. Mr. Ansana. Ron Hassan is here with us in the studio. Ron, obviously, you were downtown at some point because we see you have uh, basically soot and debris in your hair and on your jacket. What happened? Well, uh, one of the MSNBC cameramen and I were trying to get across the street, having uh, driven down to try to cover the event, uh, obviously, for, for NBC. And uh, as we were going across the street, we were not terribly far from the World Trade Center building, the South Tower. As we were cutting across in, in, in a uh, quarantine zone, actually, the building began to disintegrate, and we heard it and looked up and started to see elements of the building come down, and we ran, and honestly, it was like a scene out of Independence that everything began to rain down. It was pitch black around us as the, the winds were whipping through the corridors in lower Manhattan. I ducked around the corner, got into a car which was open, and it was it was nighttime for several minutes before oh, things cleared up. the first tower? That I believe it was the first tower class. This was the South Tower, and uh, as it was coming down, what, what, that looks like there is mild compared to what it was like to be at the center. It was pitch black for blocks. And was it smoke as well as dust? Well, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with my background on television, that was uh, clearly one of the most memorable days I had as a, as a journalist. I never really intended uh, to end up in a situation like that. As a, as a business journalist, I was a desk guy most of my life. I was rarely a reporter. Uh, and that one day I happened to be in Lower Manhattan and went down to cover the events of 9-11 and as was indicated, uh, got caught in the cloud and um, saw some things that I, I hope never to see again. Um, and that was just part of my history. I mean, I started off, uh, for those of you who you know, I'm sure are not familiar uh, with my time on TV. Uh, be before I get to that, I should point out, by the way, just as a matter of housekeeping, that um, Dr. Miller made it very clear uh, to me tonight that I was not his first choice to speak to you. Um, he had gone after Amanda Bynes, but apparently she's not available this evening, so um, I think that didn't work too well. Okay, it's, it's hard to judge the jokes that you use with younger people. All right, so anyway, so I, I spent uh, the good portion of my learning years in college actually as a film major and a music major before that, and never had any intention uh, to do any of this. It was quite accidental that I, I ended up at Financial News Network, which was the predecessor to CNBC. A friend of mine from high school was working there when I got out of film school. Uh, I had no job, and so he got me a job at Financial News Network. And uh, I got fired four months after that. Uh, FNN cut back 90% of its editorial staff four months after I got there. And I was out of work for four months. My friend stayed on as a producer, called me back four months later, and gave me his job as a producer after I'd left as an entry-level employee. And three months after that, the only two on-air people that we had at FNN called in sick on the same day, and I got on the air. And then I spent uh, 21 of 22 years full-time as an anchor on uh, both Financial News Network and CNBC, and then over the last seven years, as, as for a brief period of time, a hedge fund manager, a contributor to CNBC, and uh, a public speaker, which is uh, largely what I do now. And it's, it's been an extraordinary run, in addition to having experiences like the one on 9-11, which, which I, I hope never to repeat. I also had the good fortune of interviewing uh, President Bush, uh, President Clinton, uh, Vice President Cheney, Vice President Gore, uh, most of the Treasury Secretaries over the last 20 years, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs, Bono, and The Edge all in one interview at one point. Um, Bill Gates actually on camera beat me 
at Madden Football when they introduced the Xbox uh, many years ago. Uh, for those of you who kind of surmise that Bill Gates never played football in his life, it was one of the most humiliating moments of my life on television. So uh, I had a wide variety of experiences over the course of the last uh, 29 years. And, and it's been truly fascinating. And, and one of the, I mean, from an educational perspective, one of the, one of the most interesting things about that experience that I had, uh, having planned on being a writer and producer of entertainment, uh, whether it was television shows or movies, I ended up in a vastly different place than I never anticipated I'd be. And it turned out to be the single most fascinating professional experience in my life. Uh, as I mentioned, I got to do things that I never thought uh, I would do. Spending time in the White House with presidents, uh, going to a state dinner at one juncture, and, and sitting with a, a wide variety of people that I'd uh, known or grown up with, uh, watching my whole life and, and having this rather unique experience uh, during the Clinton years, or traveling around the world uh, to cover markets and economics and politics has, has, been, has been in itself an education. And, and the biggest education about that was the, the fact that the opportunity came out of nowhere. It was entirely unexpected. Um, but I remained open to the possibilities when that opportunity showed itself. And, and it turned out to be a, a spectacular run. And at, at this stage of my life, I do it a little bit differently than I did when I was a full-timer on television. Uh, but it, it's still quite interesting. Most of my life actually is spent in a situation like this. I give about 45 speeches a year on the economy, on the political situation, uh, on markets. I understand some of you have an investment club here that, um, that you're very actively involved in. And I guess uh, Brandon is uh, in second place um, in, in that, uh, that club. So, But he said not for long. He indicated it. So whoever's in first place, I don't know if you're in here this evening, he's coming for you rather hard. Oh, you look okay. He's coming. He's in second. Right. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I, it's, um, it's, and by the way, it's something that I never studied when I was your age. Uh, I was fairly convinced when I was in high school that I was going to be a rock drummer um, and that uh, by this age I would have been retired or in a si similar situation as the Rolling Stones being way too old to be on stage but still doing it anyway. Uh, that never materialized, film never materialized, and the two things I said I would never do as a career, which uh, was work on a game show and involve myself in business are the two things, the only two things I did after I got out of college. I had part-time work on a game show uh, when I was unemployed between FNN stints, and then I worked in financial news my, my entire adult life. So your life can surprise you just a little bit, but actually can surprise you quite nicely uh, if you stay open to some of these op opportunities. Now, with respect to the news and what's going on in the economy, uh, Dr. Miller and I had, had planned the government shutdown for today, so uh, this has worked out quite nicely for us that we have something to talk about. Um, there is a lot of insanity going on in Washington right now, as we all may well know. Um, I won't ascribe it yet to any particular political party because I'm going to get the sense of the room before I make a commitment as to which way to go on this. Um, but most of my life is really not focused on politics. It's, it's, it's focused on economics, and financial markets, and what those things mean to the average person. So Wall Street as a concept is, is very often uh, something that's not terribly familiar uh, to most individuals. It's, it's an abstraction, it's a, it's a place, less so today than it was when I first started, since more and more of what goes on there is electronic as opposed to uh, human driven. Uh, but it's, most of the time people look at the stock market and have no idea why it's relevant to them. And I, I've spent nearly 30 years trying to explain to people why these things matter so much. The stock market in and of itself is kind of a barometer of the health of our economy. And the up and downs of, of each and every day may not be that important, but the trends that take place on Wall Street very often and very deeply affect Main Street. When I was 26 years old, I, I went to visit a friend of mine who was in college at med school in Northwestern in Chicago, and I had never done any reporting in my life, and in fact wasn't intending to that week. Uh, I had gone out to visit him just to hang out in Chicago. It was one of the financial hubs in the U.S., and things like stock options and other uh, more advanced uh, in trading instruments were being developed at the time. So I wanted to go out and learn a little bit about it. And so while he was in med school, I was hanging out at some of the exchanges in Chicago. And it turned out that when I arrived at the Chicago Board Options Exchange, uh, it was Monday morning, October 19th, 1987. Now, for most of you, that day probably has absolutely no relevance whatsoever. But it was the day in which the stock market suffered its largest single crash in history. Uh, the Dow fell 23% in a single day. So it would be the equivalent of falling, you know, uh, several thousand points 
in today's terms. We fell 507 points that day, and it was my first reporting experience ever in my life. I had never been out of this, uh, out of this, off the set, and it turned out that instead of visiting my friend for five days in Chicago, I ended up working 12 hours a day covering the crash of 1987, which actually formed and helped me understand uh, how to report on markets, particularly during periods of big stress, which is something that we've all experienced over the last five years. You guys may not be quite as aware of it as your parents. Um, you know, five years ago, uh, when most of you were still in junior high or maybe even uh, in middle school, we had an enormous economic crisis that almost knocked us into a depression. And since then, we've come back rather nicely uh, and, and have enjoyed a recovery. While it's not as satisfactory as some would like, it's still certainly better than what might have happened if uh, things had gone differently. Uh, many of you have probably have studied bits about the Great Depression, uh, but we came very close to repeating what happened in the United States in the 1930s, only five years ago. When in the 1930s, the unemployment rate went to 25%. Uh, the economy didn't grow for a good, on a sustained basis, for a good 12 years. In fact, it took World War II to get us out of the Depression. And we could have faced a scenario that was very similar to that if we didn't have some smart decisions made by people like Ben Bernanke, who's chairman of the Federal Reserve, and others who kind of kept this crisis uh, from becoming a, a true-blown depression. And this is the thing right now that is driving almost all policy that's coming out of Washington. Now, the politics have gotten a little bit out of control and, and may not have a direct uh, uh, correlation to what happens on Wall Street, but the e economic environment over the last five years has really driven a lot of the political reactions. The Tea Party uh, grew up out of a statement actually made by one of my colleagues on CNBC, Rick Santelli, who in a moment of uh, anger and uh, moral outrage decided to tell President Obama on television about five years ago that no one should be bailed out of their houses if they were about to be foreclosed upon, and it was just too bad if you lost your house. And that was the single line that got two and a half million YouTube hits after he said it that helped to launch the Tea Party in this notion that the government isn't there to bail people out or support the economy to the extent that it has over the last five years. And this is where we find ourselves today. We have a Tea Party contingent in Washington that has now dug itself, has dug its heels in rather dramatically and has uh, helped to precipitate this government shutdown that happened last night at midnight. Um, typically, this is not a big deal. We've seen these things happen in the past. We had, in 1995, a government shutdown that lasted uh, for quite a number of days. Uh, we've seen the government shut down for one reason or another 17 times over the last several decades. But this one might be a little different, and it might go on a little longer because both sides are so fixed in their positions about what they want. The Tea Party Republicans would like to defund Obamacare uh, and delay the implementation at the very least for another year, the White House feels no reason to negotiate since it is the law of the land and it's been upheld by the Constitution. There's no reason for the President uh, to uh, compromise when the Affordable Care Act is in fact a legitimate constitutional law. You may not like it, but that is, that's the, those are the facts on the ground. So a lot of this has been driven by what happened five years ago uh, during the crisis. A lot of these splits, uh, both between the parties and within the parties, began to develop because of the crisis and because people had very different views of how government should interact with the economy, particularly during periods of stress like this one. Now, thankfully for most of us, we've kind of gotten through this period uh, without as much pain as, as, as we might have feared. Now, there's a whole group of Americans, 47 million of which are on food stamps. Uh, nearly a third of the population is living at or below the poverty line, uh, who are still being hurt by the recession that we had over the last five and six years. So it's, it's, it's not a, a uniform recovery. Not everybody's benefiting from 150% rise in the stock market, a rebound in housing prices, and things like that. It's still an uneven recovery. 95% of the gains that we've seen in financial markets over the last five years have actually accrued to the top 1% of income earners in the country. So a lot of people aren't feeling this good time. And for those of us who live in the market bubble, uh, it's easy to forget that there are people out there who are kind of stranded. Uh, if they were construction workers, it's very difficult to get a job. If they don't have the skills to work in manufacturing, uh, they have some difficulty in taking on some of the new responsibilities that go with robotics, software programming, and things like that that are used in the making cars and 3D printing and in technological innovation that you've all been benefiting from. I mean, the social network revolution is very, very big, and not everybody can involve themselves in, in that business if they don't have the right education and the right skills. 
So it's been an uneven recovery, and those who have done the best continue to do well, and those who fared the worst continue to do poorly. Uh, now, having said all that, for those of you who are looking out you know, into your futures with respect to jobs and where the economy will likely be, either when you graduate high school and you're trying to get a part-time job or graduate college, I actually think the U.S. economy is in great shape three, five, and ten years from now. We're having a huge energy boom, which some of you may be familiar with because we're producing natural gas and crude oil at record rates. Manufacturing's coming back home to the United States. We're making more automobiles here than we ever have. Uh, technology, as, as many of you well know, and, and from watching my daughter manipulate it in ways that I can't possibly understand, there is a lot going on in that space uh, that's going to be very exciting for you as a knowledge-based economy becomes really the norm for what we do in the United States, and that's where you guys will benefit. And then real estate's turning around a little bit as well, so that's becoming a tailwind for the economy instead of a headwind. So I would say that in three to five years, the U.S. economy is going to be the strongest in the world. Some say it'll be China. I would disagree. Some say it might be Europe. I would definitely disagree. Uh, some talk about Brazil, India, Russia. Most of those economies will not likely be stronger than the U.S. down the road. Japan is probably questionable as to whether or not it'll ever recover uh, to the peak that it saw in the late 1980s. So from my perspective when I talk to you guys, I think despite what you hear on the news or what you read in the newspapers or see online, the future for the U.S. is actually quite strong. Some of the things that are taking place here are really revolutionary with respect to how much energy we're going to produce in the next five years. We will be a bigger oil producer in 2020 than Saudi Arabia or Russia two of the biggest oil producers, the two biggest oil producers in the world. We'll have more natural gas than any other country in the world. We'll be exporting it to places like Japan, which will make the economy that much stronger. We'll be a manufacturing powerhouse because some countries now are coming here because the cost of energy is so cheap, it makes us that much more competitive. So German manufacturers will open up shops in the United States to take advantage of low-cost natural gas, which is an expensive input if you're in Germany. Natural gas costs five times what it costs here in the United States. If you're in Japan, ten times. So there are a lot of things going on right now that don't get talked about much, and understandably so, and, and nor would they necessarily be some things that you're focusing on at this stage in your life. Uh, I certainly wasn't. Now, we did, in high school, have some vibrant political and economic conversations, as I recall. Um, they were probably slightly misguided, despite uh, what we thought at the time, because we were fairly certain at that age we had all the answers about uh, the economic problems that we faced in the 1970s, which were very different than what you guys face today. We had double-digit inflation, double-digit unemployment, and double-digit interest rates. My first car loan for a 1979 four-door tan Chevy Nova, and I, I can see a smile from some of the adults here because they know just exactly how lousy that car was, was 20.5% for a $2,000 loan. You can go out and get a car with 0% interest rates today and, and get and effectively pay nothing up front. 20.5% for a car loan, 20% for a mortgage. That's the economic environment that I was leaving high school and leaving college in. Radically different from the environment that you guys face today. And the outlook, ironically enough, as I was coming out of college, was as good for me as it might be for you. I had a brand new industry uh, in which to get involved. Uh, the cable television industry, which was very, very small when I left college. Uh, Financial News Network was in 13 million American homes. CNBC today is in 100 million. So I got the benefit of the growth of that brand new industry that really just destroyed the broadcast television model. And for the generation just before you, they had the internet, which is effectively now encroaching on traditional media like cable television, music, broadcast television, and as you move now deeper into social networks and smartphones and other forms of mobile communication, that's going to radically alter the landscape, open up a variety of jobs, and also we can kind of destabilize some of the jobs that some of us uh, made our living doing. Uh, you know, we're very quickly, those of us who are over 50, becoming dinosaurs in our own business as we watch what's going on uh, with mobile communications, with what's, what's happening on the web. You know, when I first started at FNN, Having a blue and white stock ticker tape that went across the bottom of the screen was a revolution on television. In those days, you had to walk down to a brokerage house and look at the stock quotes as they passed on the uh, electronic ticker at the brokerage house office. Then you could see it from home. Now you don't need me anymore because you just take out your smartphone and you've got all the stock quotes you want for free without having to tether yourself to a television set. 
So you guys are about to go through an extraordinarily revolutionary time in communications, in media, in uh, things like 3D printing, which are going to revolutionize manufacturing and healthcare. It's a very exciting time to be your age. Your life expectancy might be uh, one and a half times mine. There's some speculation you guys will make 100, if not 150, by the time they figure out genomics, by the time they can actually, with a 3D printer, stamp out a human organ that can be transplanted rather quickly and cheaply into your body, much differently than what we've seen in prior generations. And some people talk about the upper limit of lifespan being 150. Even that's coming into question. Now, granted, I don't know if I want to make it that long. As much as I love my wife and my kids, you know, about 80, 90, if things are starting to, you know, fall off a little bit, I'm, I'm ready to take the plunge. But, you know, um, but beyond that, and I've told my son, who's only 11 years old, he hates when I say this, if, if I get to that point in my life where I'm in one of those movable scooters and things aren't going well, just make sure we're up on the second floor, open a window, and let it go. <laughs> uh, and he, he begs me not to bring up that rather dark uh, moment, but... Um, I then remind him that there's insurance money behind it because you're much more happy about it. <laughs> um, so I don't want to drone on for, for all the time. I'd love to open this up to questions because I'd like to make this interactive. It's a lot more fun that way. And uh, to the extent that you guys really want to know about how incompetent some of our elected representatives are in Washington or uh, how financial markets work or what's going to happen in the economy next, feel free to, to fire away. I'll go so far as to answer questions about a three-year period in which CNBC forced me to wear a hairpiece on television. I talk about that all the time. Uh, it's actually kind of good therapy for me, and I, I can see if a couple other people that might help them out as well. So um, feel free to fire away if you so choose. And don't be shy. This is going to end up like uh, first Blue's Day off. Though. Yes, sir? Uh, when you talk about the country being in good shape or the economy for the next three years to come, how does the amount of debt, the, the extent of debt the country have, has a uh, play into effect? Well, it's a real issue. I mean, you know, as you know, we've had the, the government shutdown itself is over the budget process. Uh, in two and a half weeks on October 17th, uh, we'll hit our debt ceiling, which is $16.7 trillion. Uh, our debt as a percentage of GDP, if you look at the gross debt in the United States, it's 100% of GDP. We have a $16.6 .6 trillion economy. We have $16.6 .6 trillion in debt, which has which doubled under President Bush and has since gone up another six billion dollars since President Obama took office. Um, without ascribing blame, I and mean, President Bush had some unique circumstances he had to deal with, 9-11 being one of them, fighting two wars, cutting taxes to revive the economy, uh, those types of things were very expensive, and once that ball got rolling, President Obama not only inherited, but exacerbated the amount of debt that we have. Now, there are countries that have suffered greatly because of heavy indebtedness, like Greece, which we have heard about over the last couple of years, but Greece, is a very odd analogy to use when talking about the United States. Greece is a tourist destination with a government. Um, it's, it's not a country. As an economy, it's about the size of New Jersey. Um, there, up until recently, 50% of the population worked for the Greek government. They got paid for 14 months of work, worked for 10, and didn't pay taxes. So that's an unsustainable model. When we look at the United States, if we were to grow slightly faster, uh, and address the entitlement issues that we have. Uh, we could get away with the debt situation that we have today uh, as long as deficits, the annual debt that we accumulate, stay under 3% of GDP. So, if, 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 and they're on their way down to that. Uh, you guys probably don't keep score in this regard, but the deficit that we suffered at its peak during the crisis was $1.4 trillion. And as we close out the fiscal year as of yesterday, the deficit for, our, for this last fiscal year is somewhere in the neighborhood of about $650 billion. So it's been more than cut in half since it peaked, and it's going to be even lower over the next couple of years. Stronger tax receipts, faster growth, uh, and some tax increases that have, have shrunk that number rather considerably. The problem is, and we see it in Greece as, as a really you know, strong example of what could go wrong, is when people lose faith in a country's ability to pay. Now, at the moment, the United States has zero inability to pay its debts. Interest rates are really low. The cost of servicing the debt is very, very low. In fact, it's the lowest it's been in about 50 years. Um, so we don't have a problem. If we were to start running up deficits that were extraordinarily large again, uh, not, that they're large, not that they're not large at the moment, but if they got larger, or if the economy went into another recession, which was largely responsible for a huge fall off 
in tax collections that made the deficit even that much bigger. Then we can start running into trouble with foreign countries that finance our deficit, like China, like Japan, like Britain, and like Holland. Those are the four biggest holders of U.S. debt. Now, the good thing is when we talk about the energy crisis, the energy um, uh, revolution, the more we export crude oil, natural gas, and other energy products, the smaller our trade deficit becomes and the less we have to rely on other countries to finance our deficits. So that's my view, and I think once that starts happening, when we become an export powerhouse when it comes to energy, that changes the deficit and debt outlook rather dramatically over the next three, five, and 10 years. Now, I'm in the minority when it comes to talking about debt that way, uh, but I think that's what's going to happen. There are a lot of people that I talk to, you know, have to argue with on CNBC who think the U.S. is going into another depression, uh, think we're going to have another crisis, that interest rates are going to spike, uh, the dollar is going to collapse, and, 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 and we're going to have a, a recession that was worse than the one that we just came out of. I don't see that happening. The financial markets aren't issuing any kind of warning signs that would suggest that today, uh, nor do I see any on the horizon. So while the debt is a problem, it is still manageable. I mean, I would have loved it if President Obama would have adopted, and, and some of you are probably familiar with this, uh, the Simpson-Bowles Deficit Reduction Plan that was put out a couple of years ago by former government officials who really laid out a very intelligent path on how to cut the deficit and how to start cutting back the debt. Now, unfortunately, President Obama and Congressman Paul Ryan both threw them under the bus and didn't follow the plan at all, which is part of the reason, by the way, by the way why we're in the middle of this government shutdown. No one's been able to agree on budget and debt and deficit issues now for a good four and a half, five years. And so that's why we're in the situation. I worry a little bit less about debt and deficits than most people, mostly because I see, as I said earlier, a lot of positives from the U.S. economy that will change a lot of the map that has to do with that particular issue. Yes, yes ma'am. Um, when you talk about becoming like an energy powerhouse, do you think that that means that you can get rid of Yes, no, I, I absolutely agree that sustainable energy would be a better, better solution um, for a variety of different reasons. Environmental, um, the ability to have renewable resources that aren't entirely um, taken from the ground, like energy and natural gas. Uh, some of the side effects of fracking or, or hydraulic fracturing are contamination of groundwater, uh, more methane into the atmosphere. Uh, those things are pretty serious, but they're, unfortunately for us, the easier answer. And so when confronted, when a government is confronted with two options, it typically takes the easier way out. And given that we've, there's been a lot of investment in technology, uh, there are horizontal drilling, hydraulic fracturing, the ability to use computers and other devices to find big pools of oil in shale deposits, we are gonna drill as much as we possibly can for as long as we possibly can to become more competitive with traditional energy sources. It may not be the best option. That's the reality on the ground. Ultimately, you really can't replace carbon-based energy with alternatives to the extent that we could power this country going forward in a meaningful way. They're all part of the solution. Um, they're currently not necessarily economic. When you've got natural gas at $3.50, you really can't start engaging in wind production until natural gas jumps to $9. We're a long way from that. And given that there's a glut of natural gas, we're not likely to see that number again. So in as much as it would be a better solution, it's currently uneconomic, and to the extent it's uneconomic, it will be less and less focused on alternative sources of energy. This is just the reality of economic and political <coughs> reality of what's going on, and more and more focused on things like crude oil, natural gas, and refined energy products. Um, the net benefit won't be environmental, but it will be economic it will make the United States a much different country, much more like it was in the 1950s and 60s uh, than it was in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So yes, that would be a better solution, but I, 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 would, I would not bet that that's a solution that will ultimately come about. Yes, sir. I wonder if you could talk about criticism of the Trump nose that has become more sort of entertainment-based and, and perhaps even responsible for the bubbles uh, or the polarization watching. Where's Brian Shackman? Did he leave already? He snuck out. He snuck out? Well, Brian is largely responsible, I think, for <laughs> some of the problems we have in cable news today. 
Uh, now listen, this, one of the reasons I don't do it, like, I don't know, are any of you related to anybody at CNBC management? <laughs> no. The business has changed radically since I got into it. So I got it in 1984 when it was a very, very young business. Uh, most of us were pretty well intentioned in trying to do straight news. Uh, whether we were in general news or whether we were in business news, um, we, we tried pretty hard to do, I think, a reasonable job, an accurate job, a fair job, in presenting what we, you know, what we reported as, as fact. Today there is an enormous entertainment component in cable television. And part of it, and in some of this, way precedes all of us. I mean, there were guys on TV uh, when I was a kid, guys like Morton Downey Jr., who you should have absolutely no familiarity with, who kind of started off, he was known as the mouth. He was one of these very, very talkative guys, very opinionated, very uninformed, but it didn't matter. His presentation was compelling enough that a lot of people watched what he did. We went from that to Phil Donahue to Oprah Winfrey, and so that form of talk, and then we had right-wing political radio come up as well, which garnered an enormous audience. And eventually that bled over into how we produced cable television. Fox News came on the scene uh, with its own brand of, um, of political talk. MSNBC then fought to take the left-hand side of that argument in the same manner. A lot of shouting, a lot of screaming, a lot of carrying on. Uh, and then even to the extent that CNBC has adopted that model to a certain extent, uh, we tend to focus on you know, what are meatier topics but still with the same approach, a lot of yelling, a lot of screaming, a lot of carrying on. And so, yeah, we've had an impact on, on the, if you're looking at the political channels, you have an echo chamber. So people who watch MSNBC want to hear their own view presented back to them. People who watch Fox want to hear their own view presented back to them. People who watch CNBC are maybe a little less biased politically, per se, um, but there's still an element of that that's crept into the, into the, into the shows. Um, you add to that now, the fact that there are 270 reality television programs on cable and satellite today, and you've just added a new element to the mix that has really kind of confounded the model further. So Duck Dynasty, for instance, uh, a favorite of my eldest daughter, um, the premiere this year was seen in 11 and a half million homes, which was a record in the history of cable television. So reality now also dominates. So we even on CNBC have reality business shows on at night. Now with respect to whether or not we at CNBC make financial market bubbles better or worse, it, it's, I don't think so. We, sometimes the trend can be exaggerated because for the first time in history, these things have been covered 24 seven. But we had a big bubble in the 1920s in stocks without live business television. In fact, you can go back to ancient Sumeria and find evidence of manic activity in financial markets that existed then. And they may have been passing clay tablets around very quickly, uh, but they still had bubbles, and they had manias, and they had panics, and they had crashes. Uh, in the 1600s in Holland, uh, and this is a rather obscure reference, but it's one that we in the financial industry know very well. In Holland in the 1630s, people got very, very excited about tulip bulbs. And they were rare, they were imported from the Middle East, and eventually, a single tulip bulb was worth the equivalent of a house in Holland. And that market crashed and did some rather temporary but serious damage to the Dutch economy. And it's, and it's written up in a variety of different books as being the first episode of a speculative mania. And there was no CNBC at the time. So we, we can exaggerate trends by, by talking about them. We can't start them and we can't stop them. They, they start and stop on their own. Uh, certainly at the height of the internet bubble or the real estate bubble that we saw more recently, you know, things that were said on financial television may have prompted people to take the whole thing farther than they would have otherwise. But even for those of us who were cautious and telling people not to do certain things that were dangerous, we either got hate mail in one instance, more than one instance, actually in my case, um, or we were completely ignored if we were offering warnings. So we have an amplification effect, but we can't start and stop trends. I think people sometimes ascribe way too much power to what we can do in a multi-trillion dollar marketplace for a handful of voices that are on cable television. Particularly when some of these things happen worldwide and there isn't the same reliance on cable business news in other countries as there is here. So I, I don't think that the data uh, bear out the notion that we can make things happen. Like I said, we could, you know, we could throw a little gasoline on the fire, we can make it better when it's good and we can make it a little worse when it's bad. But we can't create and we can't destroy. Yes, sir, right there. 
Uh, this is kind of a follow-up and similar. Uh, recently, with uh, this summer, the whistleblowing incident, uh, well, with whether you view Stone as a hero or a traitor or not, uh, the question with uh, journalism has come to light because uh, with government intervention upon uh, which kind of news should be displayed, or if uh, I'm asking about uh, whether what was your view on the integrity of uh, journalism, what, like what should be done and what should not be done uh, in regards to recent uh, crisis? Yeah, I mean, when you look at WikiLeaks and when you look at Stone, I mean, these, these are really critical questions for us as an industry. You know, one could argue that, that over the course of a lifetime, you tend to get a little too close to your sources. It's kind of a natural byproduct of growing up with the people you cover. I mean, there are people in, in the White House today that I've known now for over 20 years, and we were, you know, young guys on opposite sides of the table, and we've gone through a lot of stuff together, and we've gotten to know each other over the years. It doesn't mean we cut anybody slack, and it doesn't mean that we, we don't do our jobs. The question is whether or not the investigative side of the business has really ceased to perform the function it's supposed to, to provide, which is to inform people of things they need to know about but don't have access to. And most of us would argue that we haven't stopped doing that, uh, although I think many of us privately probably would acknowledge if we don't do it nearly as well as we used to. And that um, that's opened the door uh, for guys like Snowden and for guys like Julian Assange uh, to get access to data. Now, they're doing it in a radically different way than we would typically, right? I mean, it's, when, when things like the Pentagon Papers were published in, in the 1960s or, you know, when other uh, great investigative work like Woodward and Bernstein during Watergate in the 1970s were done, that was real shoe leather. That was pounding pavement. That was getting sources. That was not stealing information. That was not stealing government secrets. Well, people would argue about the Pentagon Papers that that was a theft. That's an arguable point. Um, with respect to Watergate and, and taking down an entire presidency of and, and, uh, Richard Nixon, Carl Woodward and, and, and uh, Bob, I'm sorry, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein uh, did real work and got to the, the core of what was a, a very you know, uh, nasty and criminal political situation and ultimately forced a president to resign. A lot of us got into the business to the extent that we were influenced by it because of those two guys. It, it is a little harder to operate the way they did. And there are plenty of books out now that say, particularly the Washington Press Corps, is far too close uh, to the sources. And, and there has been a change in the way, there's been a slight change in the way administrations and Congress deal with us. You know, you, you do get invited down, you go to White House Christmas parties to, you know, talk to the president, shake hands, take pictures. Uh, I would say, though, that the, the relationship is still somewhat adversarial. I think it's very hard to suggest uh, that, there are, that the president, this president in particular, has a lot of friends in the press. President Bush did not have a lot of friends in the press. And clearly President Clinton, despite the fact that he is more popular today than he was as president, was still getting crushed every time he turned around. Um, so the part that really has fallen off, I think, is, is, is the real hardcore investigative stuff. But I don't, I, with respect to Snowden, I don't think stealing secrets in the manner in which he did is investigative journalism. I don't think that was his intent. I don't think that was his function. And I think a lot of us know that there are sensitive pieces of information that sometimes we simply can't publish. There was a moment after 9-11, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who is a multi-billionaire, very uh, big Republican contributor, very close to the Bush White House at the time. And this was only a couple days after 9-11. And he suggested that I take my family away from New York, or he wanted me to know anyway, about the possibility of an anthrax attack in New York City. Now, I had no idea what to do with this information. Right? I, I'm, a, I'm a business news reporter. This is not my purview. I'm not uh, in any way, shape, or, you know, uh, an intelligence guy or a military guy. And so I didn't know exactly what to do with this, because I didn't know, one, the quality of the information. So I called Tom Brokaw, who also happened to know this gentleman quite well, and asked him, you know, what, what, what should I do with what I think is potentially a real piece of information, but I can't obviously just go on the air and say, you know, people are now worried that we're going to see an anthrax attack from terrorists, right? So then I called Bob Wright, who was the president of NBC, and he agreed to call the gentleman that I talked to because they were actually very close friends. And it was not something I could legitimately report on. It wasn't well sourced. It was one person. Now, the great irony was that Tom's office, Tom Brokaw's office, was the first to be hit by an anthrax attack 
within a matter of days after that information came to me. So clearly somebody was worried about something, clearly it made its way through, but when it comes at a time, let's say immediately after 9-11, and it's not something you can nail down, you don't go on television and say, okay, we just went through the biggest terrorist attack in the history of the United States, and we're about to face another one based on one source. So you have to be somewhat responsible with this information as well. You can't just take stuff and throw it out there. And to the extent that the WikiLeaks guys and, and, and Snowden have done that, and Snowden probably in violation of most laws, uh, you know, that, that's not reporting. Uh, whether or not we should know about what the NSA is doing, I think is a separate question. Should we have been better about understanding what they're doing with now this you know, surplus of information that's available everywhere because of social media networks, because of different types of technology that allow you to scrape telephone calls, texts, and other things. Yeah, we should have been much more on our game with respect to that. But stealing it is different than learning it. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you briefly mentioned the entitlement programs. What is your general philosophy regarding that? Some might say that entitlements rob Americans of a good work ethic. That should therefore be reduced to the FDR or safety net. While others say that entitlements are a great thing and it might actually alleviate the future uh, burden on, on the taxpayers. So where do you lie? Those well, I mean, I think it's, it's clear that entitlements need to be reformed, particularly for you guys, right? I mean, this is, right now, this is your problem. Right? It's not our problem per se. We'll get funded out. Um, even with modest changes in entitlement programs, those of us who are over 50 will likely receive full benefits. The question is, what's the burden on you as the baby boom generation gets older? There's 77 million people moving like a piglet through a python in the economy. Okay, You see the bulge go through the economy, and the baby boomers, particularly the very front end of the baby boomers, have had four bull markets in stocks, they've had three in real estate, they're going to get free health care, they have, you know, they, they've actually had a pretty good life post-World War II. And it's the only generation in history that's had that type of experience, where you almost have cradle-to-grave security. Um, you do have to modify entitlement programs. Now, unlike my older brother, my retirement age is 67 instead of 65. Yours is going to be 70, at the very least. Now, if you modify retirement ages, and if you means test some of these programs, in other words, you tax based on income, that those who make more and more money pay higher and higher taxes on the money that they make, or that, that, that uh, actually goes into Social Security, Medicare, trust funds, then you actually increase the solvency, according to the Simpson-Bowles report, 75 and 85 years, respectively, for each of those two programs. So we only have to really make modest tweaks to those things, but the electorate, the voters get very, very upset when you start playing around with entitlements. Particularly, what the, you know, particularly the AARP and the older folks, and it was horrifying to me that I got my first AARP card when I was 47. You know, I mean, they're not supposed to get it until you're 65. But they're reaching farther and farther down into the baby boom to kind of enlist our aid in political causes like these. The front end of the baby boom is gonna get every benefit that they ever asked for. You know, the real question is how do we make it solvent, how do we make it sustainable for future generations? And that's gonna require these modifications. You know, now also, it may require that, and I don't know if I'm a proponent of this or not, it may require some privatization. You may have to put more away in the bank, in the market, what have you, than we were required to do, um, just because it is, by and large, unsustainable. You cannot give everybody these benefits in perpetuity. It's, it's, to give you an idea what happened, when Social Security started in the 1930s, uh, the life expectancy in the United States was between 58 and 63 years old. And the retirement age was set at 65, principally because the government figured it would never have to pay. Everybody would be dead before they collected their first Social Security check. So it was one of the greatest kind of government scams of all time, which they never expected to pay anybody a dime, unless they lived so long that they couldn't work anymore and you keep them from falling through the cracks and becoming impoverished like they were during the Depression. So that's what happened with Social Security. And it was never intended to be, as you said, it was never intended to be Social Security, Social Security disability, uh, benefits for children of, of people who die early. That was never part of that original Social Security plan. It was a safety net that kept people from falling into poverty in old age. And yeah, I would tend to think that it needs to be modified to be more of that than what it currently is. Now having said that though, during this most recent recession, were it not for food stamps, longer term unemployment insurance benefits, <coughs> Social Security disability benefits, the people who are at the very bottom would have been crushed in ways that had not, we had not seen since the 1930s. 
And if you guys ever have time, and you can do this a lot more easily than I could when I, when I was your age, you can go online and look at what the country looked like during the Depression. Some of you may have already studied it. But there were bread lines, there were soup lines, there were only private charities that could fill the void for people who didn't have enough money to eat, whereas the government has taken on that burden now. And so those entitlements, you know, relative to the top 1% getting 95% of the benefits from this recent stock market real estate rally is what, is what has kept poor people from going back to an experience that would have been like the 1930s. So there are times when it's appropriate, but then there are also times when it needs to be modified to reflect the reality that we're living in. Yeah. Perhaps one more uh, question, and then if you have other questions, come on down to talk to us. Uh, yes, yeah. up in the break. I don't want to get this down right there. Um, we talked about being a head chief fund manager. I just want you to go in depth about that, about that experience. Well, yeah, so I, went, I ran a, uh, what they call a fund of funds from 2006 to 2008, which was, I did a deal with Deutsche Bank, which allowed us to raise $125 million, and I was able to allocate money to other hedge fund managers, D.P. Shaw, SAC Capital, all 20 of the biggest hedge fund managers in the world. And we had capacity with, uh, I think, another 15 or 20 more. And started the business in March of 2006, we began raising money in June of 2007, and I was effectively out of business by April of 2008. So going in depth on my experience as a hedge fund manager is very hard to do because it was such a brief experience that got crushed during the crisis. Now, having said that, I also learned the business from the ground up having to start it on my own and learn the legal, compliance, marketing, sales, uh, and asset allocation aspects of the business brand new. It was a fascinating experience, and one of the reasons I did it was I wanted to try applying what I'd learned as a business journalist as a money manager. With the goal ultimately of not just being a fund of funds guy, but actually actively managing money somewhere down the road. And because I think very much like what I'd done prior to that, financial markets are like three-dimensional chess every day. There's a different variable every day, something new happens, you know, sometimes there are incompetent people in government who make horrible mistakes at night, about midnight less than 24 hours ago, and do stupid things that can mess up the markets. And, and every day you have to figure out what those variables are and how you beat them and make your clients money. And it's, it's a really complicated intellectual challenge, and it's, it's actually exciting. In some ways I find it more interesting than what I, not what I did on TV then, but certainly what I do now. There, there's, there's so much more to it than most people realize, that you really have to know a lot about a lot of things to be a good money manager. You have to pay attention to world events every single day because any one of them, however silly, you know, or however serious, can affect your job every minute of every day. Now, trading is one thing. I have a friend who just retired from commodity trading, and he was a 24-7 guy who did 1,100 trades a day electronically, which will eat through your stomach, you know, over a period of time, so you can't do it anymore. Now, managing money the way I did was, was, was le much less stressful insofar as we allocated money to other very solid professional managers, and I had an easier time sleeping at night, except for the crisis when things got really nasty. But it's, look, it's a great challenge, and, and it's certainly, a, a, as, a, as an industry, I think it's underappreciated, partly because of things that happened in the crisis. You know, Wall Street does not have a great reputation, and to a certain extent, deservedly so. But there are some honest people, in fact, there are a lot of honest people in the industry, we're trying to do good things for the clients and trying to work as a money manager and figure out all the stuff that's going on every day of every week and making appropriate choices that allow people to, you know, save for retirement, put their kids through college, uh, you know, secure their income into the future is a good job. You know, and it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to do. Uh, I, I found it fascinating. If I get a shot to do it again, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Um, but I mentioned to you that I was, I was a music major uh, to start college and I played the band when I was in high school. And we just signed on with collegebands.com. My old college band is going to be online now within the next couple of months. So this is a dream deferred. Uh, I had to wait till I was over 50 for my college band to get signed by a label. And it's horrible music. It is truly, truly horrible. But this guy is just collecting music from failed college garage bands and putting them on the web. So I think that might be my next phase after money management. So you guys have been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. It was a